Welcome to tonight's open lecture, which forms part of our series of university-wide events marking the Black History Month of October. Black History Month in the UK is in its 35th year, and the theme for 2022 is time for change, action, not words. Here at the university, we have been hosting a variety of events to celebrate Black contributions to British society and to foster an understanding of Black history in general. In addition to the celebratory aspects, this month presents an engaging space of mutual reflection on the achievements and innovative contributions to the social, political, and cultural development of the United Kingdom. My name is Dr. Olivia Carpenter, and I'm a lecturer in the Department of English and Related Literature here at the University of York. I specialize in Black studies and the literary history of 18th and 19th century fiction. I'm at work right now on a book on the literary history of Black characters in British fiction from the first half of the 19th century, and the research for this book project provides the inspiration for the talk I'm giving this evening. I won't be sharing any sensitive images in my presentation slides today, but I sh should tell you now that I will be discussing some sensitive topics tonight about the history of race and racism, as well as the history of slavery. This is a little bit more about me as well. In many ways, the impetus for building my current book project started all the way back when, as a teenager, I fell into a Jane Austen obsession that has never really left me. Austen's ability to describe the interior lives of young women with such grace and nuance was captivating, and I felt transported to a mythical England as a young American. These books seem to promise me access to a land full of beautiful landscapes. Think Mary Ann, rambling tearfully in the English countryside in Sense and Sensibility. Um, and the promise that true love conquers all. Um, think the way Captain Wentworth waited for Anne. In many ways, I saw characters with whom I very much wanted to identify, independent, sensitive women, with witty, charming personalities, and a desire to exert at least some control over their own destiny. In many ways, however, I did not see characters who were much like me at all. As a mixed race person myself, I chalk this up to something I took for granted as a matter of fact for the time, that British literature, especially during the early 19th century, must be very white, and that while I might be able to relate to Austen heroines in other ways, I wouldn't find anyone who shared my racial background in any Jane Austen novels. It's a pity then that I never picked up a copy of Sanditon, a novel Austen sadly left unfinished by the time she died in 1817 at just 41 years old. Austen had started work on the manuscript in January, but passed away in July, leaving us to guess the fate of the characters in Sanditon, including Jane Austen's sole character of African descent, a young heiress called Miss Lamb, Charlotte Haywood, who narrates the fragments we have, tells the story of life in Sanditon, a fishing village turned would-be tourist destination. Miss Lamb visits the town along with two other young ladies, the two Miss Beauforts, who are all under the care of a Mrs. Griffiths. Miss Lamb stands out among Mrs. Griffiths' charges for a variety of reasons, one of them being that she is a mixed-race Black person, which Austen clearly states in her draft of the novel's 11th chapter, when the anticipated arrival of Miss Lamb to Sanditon finally occurs. After all, other characters have been waiting for her for another key reason that causes her to stand out. The somewhat scheming Lady Denham has been hoping that a sickly heiress would come to Sanditon to avail herself of Lady Denham's cure-all remedies and might, while visiting, fall in love with Lady Denham's handsome but roguish nephew, who has, moral, who has problematic morals at best. The delicate Miss Lamb checks every last item on Lady Denham's wish list. Sadly, unless some great and strange archival miracles rain down upon us from heaven, perhaps, we are unlikely ever to find out if Miss Lamb will fall into the clutches of Sir Edward and his aunt, and the manuscript cuts off shortly thereafter. An innocent young lady in peril, scheming ants, Mr. Wickham too, just what teenage me was hoping to find. 
If I could ask for three literary historical wishes, a complete manuscript of Sanditon would most definitely be one of them. Seeing a black woman character fleshed out by Jane Austen at the top of her writing career would have had teenage me jumping out of my seat and the very thought of discovering such representation in the archives of British literary history still fills me with a certain yearning to this day. That initial yearning led me to ask questions about my about my relationship to British literary history. And I continued looking for answers during my undergraduate degree, kept pursuing them through my PhD, and I continue pursuing them now as I near completion of my current book manuscript. Tonight, I wanna to share some of these driving questions with you and tell you a little bit about the answers I've been able to find so far. Um, but my very first question is a simple where. I asked, where are all the Black people in fiction from Jane Austen's time? They must be somewhere. Did British novels from Jane Austen's time ever include Black people, and how were they represented? I decided to make this question the focus of my doctoral research and started reading novels from the period with this question very deliberately in mind. Now, Jane Austen's period, somewhat comically, technically sits in two periods of of academic literary study. This makes me happy, honestly, because that means two different kinds of specialists, at the very least, spend time looking at the opening decades of the 19th century. The first camp is those who study what academics call the long 18th century, which spans from near the end of the 17th century until about 1830. And the second camp is called the long 19th century, which typically reaches back into the late 1780s or thereabouts, and often includes the opening decades of the 20th century. And I say all this to help you understand why we're starting to answer this question by looking all the way back to 1688, um, and thinking about a novel written by the figure on the very left of our screen, a woman named Aphra Bain. Bain was quite a fascinating literary character in her own right. She wrote plays, poetry, and prose during the Restoration period, when King Charles II returned from exile in continental Europe to restore the authority of the British monarchy. In addition to her writing, Bain was also a spy for King Charles in Antwerp in the 1660s, before poor financial support from the crown forced her return to re return to London, at a time when the novel, as the literary form we recognize today, was just starting to be formed. Bain chose to make a Black African man the focus of her book. His name makes the title, which is called Orinoco. The tale is a sad and violent one in which Orinoco and his beloved wife, Emma Winda, another an African woman, suffer under the institution of slavery and die horribly in a rebellion of enslaved people in Suriname. It can be difficult to decide just what to make of this novel, written by one of Britain's most illustrious white women public personalities of her time, about two sympathetically presented but ultimately doomed Black characters. Bain openly celebrates the nobility, honor and grace of her black hero and heroine, even if she makes no room for their survival. Bain may or may not have ever actually visited Suriname herself, and archival evidence suggests that the rebellion Bain portrays in the novel is entirely fictional. Novels were still such a new form in British literary history at this time that we can think of them as quite an experimental form. Authors were trying to figure out what kinds of stories they might be able to tell with long form prose writing and how they might craft the kinds of narratives that make the moves we come to expect of novels now. Compelling characters, nuanced emotional landscapes, a certain level of world building letting us into fictionalized places and spaces. When Bain chose to use this still experimental form to tell the story of two star-crossed Black lovers, she treated the novel as a space for white British readers to feel for Black characters, to long for their success and experience the devastation of their downfall. Looking back on this landmark moment in literary history over three centuries later, we can now see that the representation of Black life has in fact been a concern of British literary history for a long time, as a matter of fact, it turns out to be important to the very foundations of the British novel. Knowing this also sets up a dynamic that plagues a lot of the reading and research I'm discussing with you this evening. Orinoco is a sad tale about ugly events with a bitter ending. 
we see a novel written by a white woman that attempts to speak for black characters and invites readers to feel with black characters, but it leaves no room for black characters to speak for themselves. How can it? And it refuses to give black characters a happy ending. The presence of this novel in British literary history can therefore be hard to talk about. It may surprise us to learn that black representation is, in a certain sense, foundational to British literary history. That surprise is, however, not necessarily a cause for celebration. Representation is not the same thing as empowerment, and learning about Orinoco invites us to think critically about why this is the case. Today, Orinoco is often taught in undergraduate classrooms. We teach it to first year students on our English course here at York. And it's widely available as an inexpensive paperback to anyone who would like to read it. However, continuing to search for Black representation across the 18th century often means looking into literary historical archives for books that have been out of print for a very long time. Indeed, sometimes Black characters are the focus of the novel, as in the 1720 novel, The Jamaica Lady, written by a little known author named William Pittis. The titular heroine of this novel is a rather rambunctious mixed race black woman called Holmesia, and her greed and sexual exploits, both in the West Indies and in England, become one of the main comical plot lines of that obscure novel. Her construction as a wicked character that readers might just love to hate aligns her with white literary historical characters like Daniel Defoe's Moll Flanders, who herself profits from the transatlantic slave trade in Defoe's 1722 novel named for this complicated anti-heroine. Novels like The Jamaica Lady, however, are rare in their treatment of a black character as the main focus of an 18th century narrative. More often, we see black characters in more minor roles. If we go looking in online databases, such as Gale's 18th century collections online, or ECHO, which we often use as a tool here at the university, um, we, we can find thousands of scanned volumes from the period, and we can start finding examples of these characters found in rare books scattered in library holdings around the globe. In the 1723 novel, The Life of Carlotta Dupont, for example, a swashbuckling adventure tale written by white British author Penelope Aubin, a minor subplot involves a black character who escapes an American plantation with the titular heroine's help. We find dozens of brief snippets with black characters bringing in cups of tea or helping main characters escape the clutches of the novel's villain or providing fodder for sentimental reflection in various novels throughout the 18th century. As a particularly famous and local example, Lawrence Stern of Shandy Hall, located about 40 miles from the University of York's West Campus. Um, in Lawrence Stern's most famous novel, Tristram Shandy, in the novel's final volume, a character, Uncle Toby, the source of many of the novel's largest outbursts of warm feeling, recalls meeting a young Black girl during his military service in Europe, which turns into a reflection on the institution of slavery. When another character insists that Black women are treated worse than white women only because a Black woman, quote, has no one to stand up for her, end quote, Uncle Toby replies, quote, "'Tis that very thing which recommends her to protection and her brethren with her. Tis the fortune of war which has put the whip into our hands now. Where it may be hereafter, heaven knows. But be it where it will, the brave will not use it unkindly." End quote. In my research, I've also found a marked increase in more sustained focus on Black characters as we head towards the close of the long 18th century. As we draw closer to Jane Austen's era, for reference, Austen was born in 1775, we simultaneously draw closer to the major activism of the abolition movement in Britain. Leading up to the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, the legal abolition of the institution of slavery throughout the British Empire in 1833, and actual freedom taking effect in most colonies in 1838, major institutions such as the British legal system and the press became hotbed sites of debate about slavery. I contend that the British novel joined the debate in its own way. 
turning any British novel reader's armchair into another place to think about Black life in the British Empire and the high stakes political discussions surrounding abolition. These novels often have a complicated and rather sad relationship with their subject matter. They are mostly quite committed to an anti-slavery cause. They are certain there is something fundamentally wrong with the institution of chattel slavery as it was being practiced in British colonies at the time. And they often openly express desire for reform. A desire for anti-slavery reform, however, is not the same thing as abolition. These novels often stop short of advocating for a complete overhaul of the institution, and they often present worries about the implications of treating Black people as the social equals of white British people if and when the institution collapses. This dynamic occurs in a particularly striking way, and for me, in a particularly uncanny way. In an anonymously authored novel from 1808 called The Woman of Color. In this novel, a mixed race Black woman named Olivia no relation, I swear, is born the daughter of a white British planter and enslaved black woman on his plantation in Jamaica. Full of remorse for his treatment of Olivia's mother, Olivia's father attempts to ensure Olivia can enjoy his fortune after his death, writing a clause in his will that Olivia must travel to England and marry a distant cousin of her father. When this marriage takes place, Olivia and her new husband will both be able to take possession of his plantation and the vast fortune that goes with it. Told in the form of letters, mostly from Olivia's point of view, the novel recounts Olivia's vulnerability and misgivings as she travels to England, as well as the racist microaggressions she receives as soon as she actually enters British polite society. She quickly falls in love with her father's white distant cousin, though their love story turns out to be doomed from the start. Though the pair marry and live happily ever after for just a brief time, it turns out that Olivia's groom had not been entirely honest with her. He, spoiler alert, he was secretly married before to a poor woman whom he had been tricked into believing had died. And when it turns out that she is still very much alive and has been raising his child, Olivia's marriage and fortune both seem to collapse at the same time. However, the novel still attempts to give Olivia what it sees, what it sees as a happy ending. Olivia's father-in-law has taken such a liking to her that he finds a legal loophole to restore Olivia to her fortune in his own will. With her money back, Olivia returns to Jamaica, vowing to make significant reforms to her father's plantation as soon as she gets home, with Christian education for enslaved people being her first priority. This novel has seen lots of academic attention since Lyndon Dominique, a scholar now at Lehigh University in the US, edited a scholarly edition of the novel in 2008 with Broadview Press after discovering the only known copy of the novel in the British Library pictured at the far right of the screen. Scholars have celebrated the chance to teach a British novel in which a black heroine provides the main focus and gets many of the characteristics, teenage me, most hoped for in an imaginary black Austin heroine. Olivia is smart, determined, and often quite funny. This anonymous novel grants her a complex interior life and almost gives her a love story. But it's that all too crucial almost that becomes a major sticking point for me. The reason I urge us not to break out the champagne just yet and announce that at last we found this kind of representation that we were all hoping for, or at least that I was hoping for. In toppling Olivia's love story, the novel pointedly withholds the Jane Austen ending, the culmination in a loving companionate union that marks the heroine's ultimate coming of age, the point at which, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, she gets to embody the idea that love conquers all, especially the irritating people that may have tried to come between her and her true love. Instead of a true love, though, Olivia gets a plantation, and therein lies the problem. We find Olivia at the end of the novel not preparing to overhaul the institution of slavery, but to reform it. The first time I read this novel, I kept waiting for the happy ending in which Olivia and her new husband would take their newfound fortune and immediately set everyone free. Then I waited for Olivia to set everyone free on her own, all the freer herself without the demands of a husband legally controlling her fortune. In the end though, I walked away disappointed with all its beautifully crafted scenes of Olivia challenging 
racist microaggressions in English stately homes, the novel never gives us the resolution or the revolution that I wanted. Well, and this, this indeed brings us to our next point. Um, I learned a lot about myself as a reader in the process, about how I wanted empowered representation in these novels to give me a sense of empowerment. I also realized that in reading this novel, I was hoping to be able to access Black life and Black history through fiction in some way. But to do that, I needed to ask another question, the question we see on our slides right now. What did Black authors write about during the 18th and 19th centuries in Britain? How did Black writers choose to tell their own story, especially when representation, as crafted by white authors, could be such a mixed bag, sometimes giving Black characters lots of attention, sometimes not, sometimes portraying Black characters positively and with complexity, sometimes not. I got excited when I first learned about Ignatius Sancho, a writer, composer, public intellectual, and the first known Black Briton to vote in a general election. His collected letters were published posthumously in 1782 and give us quite a few precious snippets into his experiences and insights. As quoted in the blurb for this event, Sancho's collected letters include an exchange with the great Lawrence Stern in which Sancho introduces himself by emphasizing his own bookishness. My chief pleasure has been books, he exclaims, before going on to ask Stern to remember the abolitionist cause in his future novels. A picture of Stern, excuse me, a picture of Sancho begins to take shape. We can start to see in Sancho a man who believed that fiction and activism should go hand in hand. A man who was committed to making his life as a black man in 18th century Britain, a passionate and creative literary life. Sancho's letters are a crucial reminder of the complexity of this life. On the one hand, his letters recount some of his experiences of prejudice living in 18th century London, containing snippets such as went by water, had a coach home, were gazed at, followed, etc., etc., but not much abused. On the other hand, Sancho's letters are often about London life without treating his racial background as his primary focus. For example, he recounts his experience of witnessing the Gordon riots of 1780 in some detail when an angry mob passed by the window of his shop front on Charles Street in London. Sancho's life, music, and letters are a splendid reminder that Black history in Britain includes, but is certainly not limited to, the history of the abolition of slavery. Black history in Britain can and should be framed in terms of events that could and did include Black witnesses, literature written and published by Black authors, music composed and performed by Black authors and artists, and more. Sancho's life and creative production alone was broad enough to encompass all of these, and he was, after all, just one man. He was also most definitely not the only one. Gretchen Grazina, who currently teaches at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, devoted an entire book to the subject of Black life in London during the 18th century, which she called Black London, Life Before Emancipation. In it, Gerzina tells the story of a growing population of Black people in Britain that gave rise to a dynamic and politically active community, especially towards the end of the century and especially in London, where there were Black pubs, churches, and community meeting places. Many had escaped from slavery, especially after the 1772 legal decision, often referred to as the Mansfield decision, because William Murray, the first Earl of Mansfield, was the judge who ruled on the case. Mansfield declared that any enslaved person brought to England from colonies in the West Indies could not legally be forced to return against their will. While they did not become legally free, this is a common misconception, they could not be forced to return to plantation life, which became the impetus for many who had accompanied planters on business to England to run away and look for a new community of fellow Black abolitionists. The population of Black people in London also increased after the American Revolutionary War, when Black people who had been promised their freedom in exchange for military support from the Crown came to England in hopes that this promise would be fulfilled. A difficult life awaited Black freedom seekers in England in many ways. 
In London, which had been the largest community, Black people were forbidden by Lord Mayor's proclamation to learn trades, and the same Lord Mansfield, who ruled that enslaved people could not be forced to return to the West Indies, also ruled that Black people did not qualify for parish aid. So this meant that they were often caught in a terrible bind, unable to access the kind of job opportunities that might lead to financial stability and success, and likewise unable to access any charitable aid to help them when they inevitably struggled to find employment and or housing. Even with these major impediments in place, we still see brilliant literary production by Black authors writing in Britain during this period, such as Yukasa Graniosa, Olada Equiano, Kwabna Otoba Kogwano, and more. Graniosa, Equiano, and Kogwano were all men who denounced slavery in their memoirs and were abolitionist activists that urged Britons to listen to Black voices in the fight against the institution. Equiano's memoirs in particular are quite novelistic in parts, detailing his life before and after his enslavement with careful attention to detail and deft use of exquisite language, including some original poetry. Equiano completed an extensive speaking tour of the UK alongside the book, which remained in print across several editions. And Equiano's memoir is also now widely available and easy to access, and we also teach it here to first years at York. I recommend picking up a copy if you haven't read it already. You might also pick up a copy of the memoirs of Mary Prince, whose blue, pa blue plaque is pictured in the third picture on our screen here. Though most of the published texts by Black authors from this period were admittedly written by men, at least the ones we have, Mary Prince provided a powerful example of Black women's abolitionist activism from the time. Prince was born enslaved in Bermuda and eventually escaped slavery when brought to a post-Mansfield England in 1828. Prince, who probably could not read or write herself, dictated her memoirs, which were turned into a published book, The History of Mary Prince, in 1831. In harrowingly clear and direct prose, Prince described her experiences in slavery. Any British reader who picked up her narrative could not claim ignorance about just how bad the situation was for Black people enslaved in the colonies, especially at a time when a still alarming number of Britons were reluctant to institute a full-scale ban on the institution throughout the empire. To anyone who claimed that Black people were not suffering under slavery, Prince had a clear message, quote, that man is either ignorant or a lying person, end quote. Reading Prince can be quite the emotional roller coaster. One I certainly saw in my students when teaching her memoirs earlier this month, as a matter of fact. When reading Prince, I often feel, in a certain sense, the force of her triumph, as we can hear Prince's assertive voice insisting on telling her own story, especially when Black women's voices from the period are often maddeningly absent. On the other hand, witnessing Prince's trauma on the page leaves me feeling raw, no matter how many times I read about it or write about it. Prince explicitly states towards the end of her memoirs that she wanted to go back to Bermuda, where she had been forced to leave her husband behind, but we do not know if she ever got to go back. All we know of her literary life, however, happened here in England, where her depiction of Black life, both in the colonies and in the UK, makes an invaluable contribution to British literary history. Indeed, looking back to Prince challenges many truisms that spring up all too often and all too easily sometimes when we think about Black British literary history, especially when we're looking all the way back to the early 19th century. Statements along the lines of, very few Black people lived in Britain or even wrote anything back then, so we really know nothing about their lives, turn out to be at least not the whole truth. And continued research may well continue to complicate this even further as we continue to discover new texts written by Black authors. As recently as 2016, for example, Gretchen Grazina shared her discovery of a novel titled True Love, a story of English domestic life written by a Black author, a Black American woman named Sarah Farrow, which was published both here in the UK and in the US in 1893. The Telegraph newspaper even reported about it at the time, stating that a Black woman had published a novel in London and that readers should go and find it. 
We might also expand how we think about Black life and British literary history by looking to a figure like William Wells Brown, another Black American who wrote a novel published in Britain. While on an abolitionist speaking tour of the UK in 1849, Brown effectively got stuck here. The US passed the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 during Brown's tour. And this meant that if Brown were to return even to the free Northern states in the US, Brown would not be safe. His Northern community, according to this law, would be legally obligated to aid in his recapture into slavery and anyone caught harboring him could face prosecution. Brown chose to stay in the UK instead, writing a novel called Clotel, which he published first in London in 1853. The first people to read this all too often overlooked classic of black literature were British people. And when they opened it, they might well have been fascinated to see many of the same narrative hallmarks that we now associate with classic elements of the Victorian novel. Readers are invited to empathize with Brown's black protagonists and all their devastating fortunes and misfortunes in life and love as much as they might feel with the heroes and heroines of Victorian novels, but with a visceral twist. The misfortunes in Brown's novel are due to slavery, and though the characters are fictional, the institution that causes their suffering was very real. It is worth noting, too, that Brown constructs this novel as a work of historical fiction. With the setting of the novel beginning sometime in the very early 19th century, when slavery would still have been legal in the British Empire. So, Though it's published later, it's set when slavery still would have been legal in the, in the UK. British readers of Brown's 1853 novel would need to think both about how they might support the abolitionist cause in the US in 1853, and possibly about Britain's own history of slavery, which would have been all too recent at the time, since legal abolition of the institution had only taken place 20 years prior to the publication of Brown's novel. And now that we've just scratched the surface of what literary history has to offer us in terms of Black writers, Black stories, and Black thought, I'd like us to end by thinking about one more question. What do we learn when we read these texts, and why does this literary history matter? What does it have to teach us today? Perhaps the most important important and immediate reply to this question would be to acknowledge that in turning to these 18th and 19th century novels, we see the history that produced them brought to life in new and unique ways. And this is all the more important as we continue to live the legacy of that history in our present moment. Our own present moment often reminds us clearly and loudly of its connection to these crucial historical events when we see injustice in our own world. The news may remind us all too often of the 18th century, but it rarely allows us to hear real 18th century black voices calling for change, like that of an Olada Equiano or a Mary Prince. In turning to this literary history, we also get the wonderful opportunity to reframe our understanding of British literature and British literary studies. As we keep learning more about these texts inside and outside the setting of the university classroom, we are reminded that literature has so many gifts to give. We get to look at books we already know well in new ways when we pay attention to the contribution Black literary figures made to these books and their contexts. We also get to experience the wonderful thrill of continuing to look for new books. There are still many more stories to be told about Black contributions to British literary history. As we look back on this history together, we see not only that British literature can and should make room for Black voices right now, but that British literature could and did make room for Black voices before any of us was ever born. When we see British literature as more complicated than the exclusively very white landscape that I had incorrectly assumed it would be when I was a teenager, we can start to imagine new ways of relating to and appreciating British literary history in all its complications and nuances. We can begin to think about the ways in which this complicated literary history includes lots of people and we can start to think about ways in which we can make it more accessible for everyone. Thank you. 
Um, we have one question already. Um, so Elena says, hi Elena, thank you. Says, um, fascinating talk. I am an alumni doing research for my PhD, wonderful. I was wondering if you came across any relevant literary portrayals. Doing a quick search, I found a promising text from 1800, Obi or the History of Three-Fingered Jack by William Earle. If you've read this text, what did you think of his portrayal? Uh, I have read this text. I'll be citing it in my book. Um, it's another example of literary representation of, of um, Black people, um, and is particularly interested in representations of quote unquote voodoo magic or um, right, this interest in Obeya, which happens quite a bit um, at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, um, and coincides very strongly with the Haitian Revolution. Um, this era of revolution kind of culminates with Haitian independence, but leading up to this time, there's a, a real rise um, in armed Black resistance in the colonies. Right? One of the greatest takeaways from the abolition period is that the, the leaders of the abolition movement, both in the UK and in the colonies, were Black people fighting on their own behalf. And the kinds of armed resistance that was going on at the time sometimes makes its way into the novels, including a novel like Obi or the History of Three Finger Jack, which is available um, through Broadview Press if anyone's interested. Um, that novel, um, along with another novel named Otelisi, um, and and if and a few others as well, is quite interested in writing, portraying some of these rebellions on the page. And so they're interested in in thinking about. Um, kind of some of those current revolutionary moments in certain terms that are a little bit similar to how we saw in Afro Baines Orinoco actually, of, of the kind of figure of a potentially tragic black hero um, who takes charge of a rebellion of enslaved people. That's a long-winded answer to your question, but yes, it's a fabulous novel. It's a, and, um, I mean, it can be, it's, it's deeply troubling, but it's, it's a fabulous novel in the sense that it, it really helps us think about the history of Black revolution as portrayed in the British novel and British literary history. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Oh, we have another question from Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, when will your book be published and will it be available to readers outside academic circles? I don't have a publication date for you just yet. I'm very sorry, but yes, it will be widely available to buy and will hopefully be open access by the time uh, all is said and done. Um, stay tuned and thank you for asking. We have a question from Chloe. Hi, Chloe. I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on making these texts and stories more available to readers and students. Broadview Press has done so much to bring these novels into greater circulation. How else could we bring these stories forward? Oh, thank you, Chloe. Um, I would really like to see these stories become more widely accessible for free online as well. Um, I am hoping to contribute to more public facing databases in the future. So also stay tuned for that. Um, right. Increasingly, we're starting to see texts like these being uploaded to the spaces like Project Gutenberg and things like that. They're in the works to do that, but it's still not enough. A lot of these are still behind a paywall. A lot of these are still part of expensive databases that even our university doesn't subscribe to. And then that means that university researchers have to go to other universities that do subscribe, et cetera. Um, so I think in an ideal world, we'll, as, especially as we start to realize more and more what's out there, we'll be able perhaps in future to get funding for a project um, to turn these into a public facing database. Stay tuned, preview of coming attractions. I, I hope it happens soon. Um, we have another question from Bridget. I just wanted to say thank you for this talk. Thank you. Oh, Lila. Oh, Lila is on uh, with Bridget. Hello, Lila. I'm 14 and this is illuminating in terms of knowledge of black historical fiction. And I'd like to read some of these books. Thank you. I think I think it would really open up. I, th I think reading these books really reframes our understanding of British literary history and who it does and does not include, what kinds of representations and stories people were thinking about 
in Jane Austen's time and beyond, right? We, we there's so much of this story that hasn't been told yet, or so many ways in which we have not yet been invited to think about British history and or British literature. And when we get the chance to think about them in new ways, it could just be so eye opening, so kind of world opening. So I hope you do get the chance to read more of these books. If you could recommend, oh, Victoria asks, if you could recommend one text for study on A-level English Lit curriculum, what would it be? I'm going to be entirely honest, in my Americanness, I'm not sure exactly what's on the A-level English Lit curriculum already. Um, but of the books I mentioned tonight, I think Mary Prince's narrative would be particularly useful for students at the A-levels um, level of study. I think having been introduced to a woman's narrative from this time period um, can be enormously helpful for kind of introducing students to how they might reframe what they think they know about the early 19th century in British literary history. Right? Coming into uni with that knowledge um, can help students feel like more empowered to begin with before they ever arrive. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, another question from Isabella has just come in. I'm wanting to study Black representation for my NEA for A-levels. Are there any texts you recommend? Um, certainly Mary Prince again, as well, um, narrative of the life of, um, sorry, of Olada Equiano. Um, I think if you're thinking about representation, you should really get yourself a copy of The Woman of Color. It's anonymously authored, but it's from the year 1808, and it's available through Broadview Press, which features a Black woman as its central character and is a little bit more widely available. You might also think about representation in big classics. So um, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, as I mentioned tonight, um, is a very long novel. But if you look for the snippet at the very, very end of the text, right? the the final volume um, has a that brief representation that I mentioned in the talk, things like that. You can find, you know, if you go looking, you can you can find snippets about characters in some of the novels that you may be quite used to thinking is canonical or, or novels people talk about a lot. So there are black characters that come up in Daniel Defoe's Mall Flanders, but also Robinson Crusoe, um, things like that. But there are, you know, the woman of color is quite unique and why I really recommend the woman of color is it's because it's about a black woman. We have an anonymous question. What are your thoughts on the depiction of black characters and black history in literary adaptations of this period, both in terms of Austen and in terms of subsequent phenomena like Bridgerton? Oh, great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I think a lot of these adaptations are a good indicator that lots of people are hungry to reframe this, this literary history, right? A lot of people are, are hungry for the same kinds of things that teenage me was thinking about back in the day. Can we see more people able to access this kind of, you know, Jane Austen companion at love story? What would that look like? Is there always empowerment to be found in these love stories and what happens when black characters are able to seize control of that empowerment or not? Um, can we kind of revel in Jane Austen and, and Jane Austen style narrative? And, and is that that reveling available for everybody, right? Is the, the real enjoyment of these texts. We spend, I spend so much time teaching and analyzing them that I also have to remind myself that these are fun to read and fun to talk about. Um, fun to adapt and play around with um, and kind of making sure everybody has access to that is something that I think current media is really trying to grapple with in ways that are quite exciting. Um, and another question from Kieran. Hi, Kieran. Um, I'm doing my dissertation on African American lit. Wanted to ask, what do you think makes the writing in historical Black British fiction unique from those in America? Hmm. Well, I think a particularly a particularly helpful way to reframe that might be to think about both Black British authors and Black American authors. It's 
both part of something that Paul Gilroy calls the Black Atlantic. Um, now, if you're a University of York student, please book an office hour and come talk to me more about this. I don't want to give a too theory heavy answer tonight, but the Black Atlantic is, is an idea about Black authors um, from the time period and beyond um, that talks about the ways in which ideas were circulating through Atlantic channels from the UK to the US to the Caribbean, etc. And that some of these ideas are, are many different things at the same time, they can be British, American, Caribbean, African, all at the same time. Um, and I think when we're thinking about the ways in which black British fiction stands out, um, you, you know, it, it often we'll, we'll see black authors emphasizing a distinctly British history in all these kinds of exciting ways. So um, the specific ways in which Mary Prince narrates some of the kinds of aggressions that she experiences in England could only come from a Black British author who spent most of her literary life in the UK, I think. Um, but in many ways, Black American authors are borrowing so much from their Black British forebears. Um, and we've seen this theorized in all sorts of academic spaces as well. So please do come talk to me about that too. So I see we have no open questions in the chat and there are lovely clapping emojis coming from the bottom of my screen. Thank you so very, very much. It has been such an honor to join you tonight and get to discuss this wonderful topic. I'm so excited to be celebrating Black History Month here in the UK. Um, I'm so excited now to get to here in the UK, we celebrate in October. Um, back in the US, we celebrated in February. So every month is Black History Month, but it's great, to, it's great to have an excuse to come together and celebrate and to talk about this work. Thank you very, very, very much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>